Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you that we can be here together. And now we pray that your Holy Spirit would fill this room, that your promise of your presence, and we know that it will be fulfilled. And so, Lord, do that this morning for us. We ask this in Jesus' precious name and for his sake. Amen. This, this message is taken from Psalms 11. Uh, most theologians believe, and historians, biblical historians, believe that this Psalms 11 came out of David's experience when he was facing the greatest crisis of his life. Now, many of David's psalms came out of joy and satisfaction. Some of his psalms came out of pain and agony. And this psalm here come out of David's greatest uh, experience, his greatest crisis that he faced in life. Now, David was a, 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 a warring king. He's the one who really established and united the tribes together. And he's the one who built the great uh, uh, kingdom for, for Israel. And so he was accustomed to war. But, uh, and so this one comes, though, out of the most crisis time in his life. This is when his own son, Absalom, had now stole the kingdom from him and was on his way from Hebron, where he had set up this split-off kingdom, and to take over Jerusalem, where he would be the king, and that his family, from now on, Absalom family, would be the dynasty in the king line. And he's coming now to kill his father, to kill, uh, kill David, and uh, David, all of David's wives, and his family, and all of his family, and so he alone would be the king. And so this is an absolute crisis that this Psalms come out of. And this is sort of like a rally uh, speech that he's making to the troops that he's sending to the field of battle to restore his, him to, throne, to the throne. And so we can hear that a little bit as we hear this Psalm. Psalms 11. I'm going to read the whole Psalms 11, then I'm going to take verse 3 and use that as my sort of text for my talk here this morning. In the Lord put I my trust. How say you to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. For lo, the wicked bend their bows. They make ready their arrows upon a string, so that they may in the dark shoot at the upright in heart. When the foundation is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? And so this rally cry, he asked the question, when the foundation is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, he is fleeing. Imagine now the king, disgrace. A lot of his enemies come along beside him and say, we are glad that you are dead. You are a bloody man. Some is there cursing him out and some is there meeting to help him. And he's having to keep his troops intact because they want to go out there and cut their head off. You know? And so this is a crisis moment. And David is in pain. David is in pain as he's fleeing for his life. You can hear that. Don't say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain. That's what some of them were saying. His good people were saying, David, why don't you go to the mountain? Stay in the mountain for a few months. We will gather together again, and we'll come up, and we will build a, an army that we can defeat Absalom, because that's what David had been. He had been this great mountain lieutenant. You remember when Saul was going to kill him after him, he fled to the mountain. And in that mountain, he built together the greatest special fighting force this world has ever known. Special units are built around and modeled after David's special fighting force. They were so powerful and so committed and so loyal to David. David had to be careful what he would say to him because they would implement it. They would implement it. They was the one who would carry out any hope or any dream that David had as it related to military, they would carry it out. One day David was out just sort of stretching during the days of Saul when he was away from his home. He couldn't get back home. And he said, oh, I wish I had a drink of water from the Bethlehem well. And two of his soldiers heard that. And they went through the line 
Okay, kill a few people. And, but they got David to water and brought it back. And when David recognized how loyal they was, uh, he couldn't drink the water. He offered the water as a blessing to God for the loyalty of his soldier, that they were so loyal to him. And so they said, flee to the mountain, we'll help you. He said, don't say to my soul, flee like a bird into the mountain. In the Lord put out my trust. And then he makes this rally statement. This is the Gettysburg Address. This is the Martin Luther King's March on Washington. He rallies the troops. And this is what he says. When the foundation of society is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? And so our subject this morning is a broken foundation. And he's going to rally the troops to fix what is broken in our society. And for him is putting him back on the throne. So then what is the foundation of society? What is broken in our day in the society, in the urban community? And what is the foundation of society that holds it together? It's the family and the community. It's the family and the village. When the family breaks, it's possible to unite that family back together. We saw that in the days of Ruth. Naomi lost her family. She became without a family. Her husband and her two sons was gone. And she became a widow and an orphan in a strange land. But God restored that family. That's what the little book of Ruth was about. It's about how she came back to her home and she got married to Boaz and Boaz restored her back to the kingdom. That's that story. So the family can be reunited. But when the community is broken, see the family is the primary nurturing institution of life and humanity. And when that family is broken and severely broken, and if it's more than 51% broken, that means it's going downhill. In our society, 70% of all of our children in America is born without a father in the home. 80% of our children are being raised without an intact family. And that God wants the mother and the father to get together when they get married and love each other. And out of that loving relationship, children are born. And then with the nurture of those children and give them the certain of love. And if children grow up without that certain of love, all of the scientific, sociological, and psychology, all of that says they have a much more difficult time making it in society. Now, they can make it. That don't mean that every child is cursed. It means that a family is broken. And then when we get to the jail population, 97% of all of those children, those black children in prison, 97% of them come from families that are broken families in our society. And so we know those facts, and I won't burden you with that. But the problem is bigger than the broken family. The problem is the community is broke. And that we don't put much energy on restoring communities what we do is tear those communities down and repeople those communities with other folks. That's what we do in the society. We don't move into those communities with the idea of restoring them. We don't believe that those people who are left there in that community have value and worth. And so we, what we have to do then is remove those people, put some more people there. We call that urban renewal. And it's really urban replacement. It's really urban bringing other people in instead of seeing the dignity of those people and give those people the resources and the opportunity to develop their own neighborhood and bring the skills in there to develop those indigenous people in that community. So then we get the problem. How do we fix those two? Fix those two. How do we fix the family? And how do we fix the community? It's pretty easy to talk about how you fix the family. 
is that we, we got to help the children to delay their gratification. Because the biggest problem is that these children are being born out of wedlock. That constitutes the greatest problem we face in the community, in our neighborhood. Because that constitutes the real stream of developing poverty. And 90% of those kids who are born out of wedlock ends up in poverty in America because they don't have the support base to nurture those children in the society. And so what is the foundation of our society? It's the family and it's the community. What is the great commandment? What is the great commandment? The great commandment is a community commandment. It is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Why was David considered the greatest king? Because he was a community person. He didn't take his neighbor's land. He bought it. What made Ahab the worst king in the Bible? He killed his neighbor in order to get his land. And so the greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. And then to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And so what is broken in our society is the community. And what we are doing, basically, we are trying to caulk a broken foundation. That's what we've been doing with welfare, with clubs, and with all of that poverty program. We have been caulking the building while the foundation is where the problem is at. And so we want to go to the foundation. How do we fix the foundation? I'm going to suggest how we can fix it. But he said something else. He said, when the foundation is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? Now, he's turning the responsibility of fixing the foundation over to the righteous. The righteous is the one who will fix the foundation. So then, who are the righteous? Who are the people that's supposed to build and refix the foundation? It is the righteous. So who are the righteous? In the Bible, the righteous is the product of son. The righteous is responsible for fixing the problem in the society. Said, so who are the righteous? The righteous are those people who have discovered that they don't have any righteousness of their own and they have turned their life over to Jesus Christ and that Jesus Christ has become their righteousness. He has put his robe of righteousness on those who give their life to Jesus Christ. He closes us in his righteousness. The Bible says that Jesus Christ has become our righteousness. And so then what we must do then, if we're going to become the righteous, we got to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So the product of son, you know his story. He got mad, he got upset, he wanted to go away, he wanted all of his money, and he demanded his father give him everything he's on, and the father divided his living with him, and he took that money and went out and spent it on harlots and prostitutes and had a ball. But he discovered in a pig pen that his father, back home, still had plenty of food, plenty of supply, and so he said, I'm going to confess my sin. I'm going to go back to my father. And I'm going to say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and I've sinned against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me one of the hard servants there. And y'all know the story. The son comes back. And you remember he came back and the father ran out to meet him, to meet him, to hug him and to embrace him and brought him in, put him on the best robe had a big party for him that night and put a special ring on his finger. And you remember the son who stayed home, he gets very bad, very mad. And the father have to come out and say, why you won't come into the party and enjoy? He said, yo, this son went out and wasted all of his money on Harlot and now you are taking care of him and you have never given a party like this for me. He said, son, you have been with me all the time. Everything belonged to you. But this, my son, was lost, but now he's found. He was blind, but now he sees. Now he's back home, 
And now he has had his experience. Now let's forgive him. And I put on him the robe and I'm making him responsible for the experience. Who are the righteous? The righteous are you and me who have confessed our sin before God and have said to God, come into my life, be my savior. And that we have turned our life over to him. And he has now made us his workers and that we are to be working together to do God's will, not our own. And he told us to seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and all the things that we need to seek that righteousness with, God will provide that. That's a good deal. So we are the righteous. So my question then today, my rallying speech today is this. If the foundation is being destroyed, what can we do? What can we do? Let me suggest then five things that we can do to begin to fix the foundation. We got to fix what is broken. Number one, we got to start with faith, faith. The Bible says without faith, it's impossible to please God. But them that come to God must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently to seek him. Then how do you get faith? Where does faith come from? That's the question. Faith, the Bible says, come by hearing and hearing the word of God. So we got to go back to foundational truth. Foundational truth is the word of God. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. And so we go back to the word of God. And then we get into the word of God, truth and faith. Faith comes out of truth. And when we decide somehow or another, when God give us the instant or give us the idea that we want to obey the word of God, it's somewhere between there that faith is born. Faith is born. Faith comes when we obey God and decide, read the word of God, obey the word of God, and then want to carry out the will of God. Somewhere along there, faith is born. Faith is born. And so it takes the word of God. And so we got to read it different. We got to read it with the idea of obeying it. Most of us read the Bible as sort of an inspiration of book. We have to read the Bible with the idea of obeying it. Obeying the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. He said, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only. And if we be hearers of the word and not doers of the word, then we deceive ourselves. And so what has happened to us, we have taken in the word of God, but we have accommodated bigotry and hatred and all those things that's a contradiction to the word of God. And so we don't really don't believe that the word of God can burn through these racial and uh, barriers. The Bible says by faith we understand that the world was framed by the word of God. By faith we understand that the world is held together by the word of God. By faith we understand that the world was created by the word of God. And so the word of God is the, is the power pact of God. God is faithful to our obedience to the word of God. And so we got to come back and read the Bible. That's not, we got to fix what's broke. And then we got to raise that word and we got to raise our children in that word. We got to print it over the doorpost. We got, to, we got to nurture them in that word of God so they can have the faith to go out and be the people of God and do the will of God. That's number one. That's number one. That is so crucial. It is difficult today as I go out to churches to hear foundational stuff. It seemed like to me that the ministers and the people who are doing most of the teaching is responding to some incident in society. They are responding to some building program or some mission program. Or they're responding to some emergency. They are funding to something. They are caulking society. They are putting cops into the walls on the 40th floor when they need to be back down to the foundation. And no foundation, no other foundation can anyone love, make than that which is made. And that foundation is Jesus Christ and his word of God and his word. That's number one. Number two, we've got to de-hijack prayer. Prayer has been hijacked by our own selfishness, 
by our own need. And so we pray for God to give us all this stuff. We pray that God would give us this. God would give me a, a house. God would give me a car. God would fill my wallet up. God would do all those kind of things. Uh, we are pray for that. We got to learn how to pray again. Our prayer should be, Lord, what would you have me to do? My prayer should be that his kingdom would come because if I'm seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness, he is obligated then to meet my need because he has said it. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness and the thing that we need will be added for us to seek that righteousness. That's what Jesus meant when he said, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. That's not abandoning of self. That's putting yourself in the hands of God. He says, come unto me, all the ye that are burdened and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Learn of me. I am meek and I am lonely at heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul. And so what we need to do then is de hijack prayer. We need to take it away from the name and claim it. And we need to come back and we need to say that what young folks need to do and what we need to do is to give our life to Jesus Christ and then to see ourselves as his workers, to see ourselves and begin to listen to his will, that his will might be done and that we might follow him to do God's will. And you know, as David says later, I've never seen the righteous forsaken are his seed bread bread. And so we are that righteous force. We got God and his word on our side. And God is always faithful to his word. God has exalted his word above his name. And so the word of God becomes what we got to depend on and we got to go to what is prayer? Prayer is listening to God so that we can know how to do the will of God. Lord, Lord, what would you have me to do? And so we got to de hijack prayer. Number three, we got to decolonize the gospel. You got to imagine that the most enlightened nation in the world by the 17th, 18th century, 16th, 17th, and 18th century, uh, Europe was the most enlightened people on earth at that time. And there was a group of people who said they wanted to come to this nation and create a nation where they could worship God freely without being contaminated so they could look into the word of God and obey the word of God. And as soon as they got here and got it settled, that nation began then to buy slaves and to come in here and get slaves and use those slaves to develop that nation. And when we get to the 18th century, you got very intelligent people like Wilberforce and others who sees the evil of enslaving people in the light of the fact that when God begins to speak to us through the word of God, he began to speak to us about delivering people from slavery. God began to speak to us through Moses and began to see that redemption itself, God's model of redemption and salvation and being saved and born again and all of that is based on delivering people from slavery. That slavery to sin and exploitation and that slavery to themselves here in society. This gospel is primarily have been colonized by the colonists and they have allowed us to preach a gospel that is inferior and that gospel have become a gospel of self-preservation instead of gospel of liberating people from slavery and oppression and sin and exploitation in our society and so we got to come back then and preach the truth to our society. And that's what's so lacking in our society. As I said, I went out last Sunday 
and I sit through a crowd of people. It was a crowd of people who had come here for their revival from all of the states in the United States. And they was there. And the preacher got up there and talked 45 minutes. And he said nothing about the real issues in society. He didn't tell people anything about the social economic exploitation and all of these things that are happening to our people in society. And that's what we have today. We have a church out there that is filling itself up with people. And all it is doing is concern about the leaders and their resources and about their money and about their prosperity, but is not concerned about the suffering and the pain of our people. That's what the gospel is about. Paul could say, I'm not ashamed of this gospel, for it is the power of God to deliver people from the condition that they're in and bring them into this marvelous light where they can become God's righteous force here on earth. Number four, what we got to do then is establish an authentic church, an authentic church. The church is the body of Christ. It is the people of God who are doing the will of God, who is going from village to village, healing the sick, caring for the dying, and providing resources and help and inspiration to people in need. That's what Jesus was doing, that he was full of grace and he was full of truth. And the church is to be his body, his body. And what we need to do then is turn the church back in the hands of Christ and take it out of the hands of men who are exploring it for their own benefit and for their own good in society. That's what Jesus meant when he said, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And what has happened to us that we have now developed it with a whole lot of shepherds, a whole lot of shepherds, but they are neglecting the sheep. And what they are doing is feeding themselves instead of caring for the sheep in society. And so we've got to come back then and build that authentic church. We've got to recognize that the church is the people of God engaged in the community who are doing the will of God. Fifth and last of the thing that we can do, you really have had, if you're going to be successful, you have to have principles. We call that principles, biblical principles. We call that a philosophy. And that's what is so lacking in the church. Well, I'll go to churches and I'll hear people talk a lot about God, but they don't say anything about how we have to solve the problem of society. See, God wants us as human beings to be involved in solving the problem in society. And so what, what is the philosophy? What is a philosophy? Well, 40 so years ago, I began to see some of the problem in the little town of Mendenhall. And I said, what's broken in Mendenhall is that success for these young folks is to leave Mendenhall and not come back, and they did not connect their education to changing the condition in the community. They connected their education primarily to getting something to show that they got worth. They have had to get things to show that they were human beings. And so they were leaving Mississippi and wasn't coming back. And I began to say, what should we do in this little town? Number one is that we should stay in this little community and try to win some of these young people to Jesus Christ, disciple them, help them to go through high school, go off to college, get some skill, and bring these skills back to community so we can begin to change the neighborhood and the community in which we live. And I began to call that relocation. I was building a philosophy, relocation, getting young folks to come back to the community and care for this community and love this community more than they love greed and consumerism and materialism. Well, of course, I stayed in that community 10 years before it began to happen, and they began to come back, and that was relocation. What is the second philosophy? I began to see that we couldn't do it alone, that we needed to utilize the full power of the economy, 
and most of the economy was in the hands of white people. They had the economic power. While we had a lot of economic well, income, we wasn't turning that into assets and making a difference. All we was doing was spending our money, but we wasn't doing anything to transfer that money into the neighborhood, and doing a very little to do that. And so I began to say, what we got to do then is that we've got to be reconciled. We've got to be reconciled. We've got to do this together. And I began to read the Bible. And the Bible began to say, in Christ, there's neither black or white. Then there's a Jew or Gentile. But we are one in Jesus Christ. The Bible began to say that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, and has made us ministers of reconciliation. And if we wasn't concerned with trying to cross those racial barriers, we weren't obeying God in that community. And so I began to say that reconciliation would be a key part of what I would preach in my ministry. And then I began to see the economic reality. And I said, how do we get that happen? How do we get that redistribution of resources? How do we raise it up? When I begin to talk like that, of course, the people begin to say that he's a communist. He's a communist. He's talking about taking all the money from the rich and giving it to the poor. And I begin to say, if you take all the money from the rich and give it to the poor and leave the system intact, the rich would have it back in a few days because they got the means of production. All we would do is go out and buy new Cadillacs and Mercedes and the white folks already own those. And so they would have their money back. So what had happened, I could see that we had deified money. And what we needed to do is to put our resources into the mind and into the hearts of people and then begin to create some little models of economic development and begin to train the people in the neighborhood, in the community, how to do uh, development. And that was the third R, redistribution. When the foundation is being destroyed, what can the righteous do? We can do a lot. But you've got to make some sense of determination. You've got to decide what you're going to do with your life. And you've got to decide what you're going to give your life to. That's the most important thing. We haven't decided. We can solve the problem if we commit it to it and understand what is the problem and not give all of our attention to dealing with symptoms, but go on to the real problem. And the problem in our society is that the foundation is being destroyed, the family and the neighborhood. And so we got to fix what's broke. Without fixing what broke, we're just caulking the walls, and we are not dealing with the foundation of life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time that we could spend together, and I pray that you would use these words as they go out around the nation, and really as they go out around the world, that people would get together in small groups, and they would discuss how they can redevelop and be involved in their own neighborhood, in their own community. What an opportune time in our world for these messages to go out. So bless us and bless the remainder of our day. We ask all this in Jesus' name.